Hi, Defcon. How many of you have ever used a vending machine? <laughs> Who has ever wanted to hack them? <laughs> All right. So this talk is for you. So, uh, just to introduce myself, I'm a security engineer. I'm from Switzerland. So no, I don't speak Swedish. I don't know, but many Americans think we speak Swedish in Switzerland, but no. I speak French, so excuse my English. I also do a lot of CTFs. I love old video games. I brew and I love beer. And as I said, I'm a noob speaker, so if you have any comments, it will be greatly appreciated. So, how did I get there? First, uh, some years ago, I created a MAME cab, so it's basically an arcade machine with a, a laptop inside, and I play video games using emulators with this. And to be more realistic, or uh, to take money from my friends that came to play at home, I, started, I searched and I bought a con acceptor on an auction site, and this is the tale of what I did with this. So first of all, any kind of machines that accept coins or bills are used every day, especially I think in casinos or in Vegas, like ATMs, vending machines, slot machines, etc. And there are multiple devices that are used uh, to process money uh, and give money back. For instance, coin and bill acceptors that are obviously used to count coins and bills, can also detect if you insert a false coin or a coin from another country, et cetera, et cetera. And it uses different methods to recognize the money uh, for the weight, for the size, uh, even visually. And there are many ways to recognize that and it's used to send uh, if the coin has been accepted to the main board and the main board needs to process the events that a coin has been inserted, and it's the machine that process that you have entered, for instance, one dollar or etc. Other devices are a coin hoppers that is used to give money back, so when you need to get the change. So it's pretty much like a big tray that uh, operates uh, using some commands and uh, gives you uh, the, mo the money coin by coin back. So if you need to uh, receive back like one dollar and this tray contains quarters, uh, the main board will send a command to release four coins so you can get your change back. All of this stuff uh, communicate with several protocols. Uh, they are parallel, serial, another protocol is MDB and the last one is CC talk. As this was, all these protocols are very vendor specific, so one vendor can do normally only CC talk or only serial devices, so you need to check whether you get the right protocol you want to use. So since I didn't know about this, I just received the, my con acceptor and it was CC talk and this is what we will be talking about. So CC talk is a name for coin control stock. It's a semi-proprietary protocol maintained by a, uh, a company in England called Money Controls. Semi-proprietary because uh, the specs are available on cctalk.org, but some parts of the specs are only available after signing an NDA. So you just have parts of the information, but not everything. So you have to find something and check this. How does it work? It's simply a request and response protocol. So just send a request, the device sends you a response, and that's it. It uses an UART data transmission, so it's pretty much like a serial communication at 9.6K, 8N1 on TTL signals. And each device is on a bus, and it has its own address. Uh, for instance, one is the controller, Two is the coin acceptor, 4T is a coin hopper, etc., etc. So on the same bus, you have all the devices that can communicate between each other. A frame, a C stock frame looks just like this. So you have one byte for the destination address, 
one byte for the data length, one byte for the source, one byte for the header. I'll talk about this later. Several bytes of data. It depends on what command you will send to uh, the device. And a checksum. The header is the, the command that you, you will send to a device. And if the header is equal to zero, it means it's a response. So you don't actually have a response to what. So you need to know what you asked to, uh, to get the correct answer. The checksum is a simple checksum. It's just the complement to 255 of the whole packet. So all of these headers are commands, as I said, and from the documentation uh, you can find, you have the list of all the headers, and you have, for instance, all the headers and the corresponding commands, and if you get in the documentation, you have all the data you need to send when when sending a request and all the data that comes back so you can actually see or understand what's going on on the bus. For instance, you have here a sample command that is sent. You can see that it's a sample poll, so it's kind of like a ping for uh, a device on the bus that is sent from the address 1, so it's normally the main board, to a device at address number 2 normally a coin acceptor. And if you send this, you will probably see a packet like this on the same bus, which is a response, zero, to what? We don't know. From device at address two to device at address one. So just again, just by looking at those packets, at the response, you cannot know exactly a response to what it is. You have to sniff the bus all uh, with the, the request to actually see the response and know exactly what it is. The second packet here is header number F6 in X, which is request manufacturer ID. And in the response, you have NRI, it's the manufacturer of the device I, I bought. So I've been able to ping this device to know uh, some information about this. Now, I wanted to actually know if there was a coin entered, if it was correct, if it was uh, one Swiss francs, two Swiss francs, etc. So, in the documentation, you have a header number 229 that you just send to a coin acceptor and you receive back 11 bytes. The first byte is the counter, and you have five uh, groups of uh, two bytes as a result. The counter is actually uh, every time the device has uh, a new event, like uh, you inserted a coin, uh, the coin was accepted, was refused, etc. This counter is incremented. So for the main board, you have to actually know which was the state of the counter, and if there's an increment, you know that there was a new information and you have to pass it. The results are sent in two bytes, as I said. Uh, normally, the first result uh, contains what is called the validation channel. Uh, on uh, coin acceptors, uh, you have uh, what is called validation channels. It's normally uh, 16 uh, ways or kind of coins it can, it can recognize. So you can uh, uh, make the device learn 16 different coins. And each one of these is uh, assigned an ID, and it's that ID that is uh, sent in the response. So <coughs> there's a nice trick there, because uh, since you only have the ID, the coin acceptor only knows an ID. It doesn't know which kind of piece of uh, coin or its value. It only knows an ID. And the main board needs to correlate the ID with the actual value of the coin that has been inserted. We'll check that after. The second byte it contains the error code. So it's, if it's a bad coin, if there was an error recognizing the, the coin, or if the coin was accepted. The problem is that uh, all these codes are vendor specific. So if you buy different kind of uh, coin acceptors, there won't be the same uh, error codes or error IDs, etc. And even sometimes the, the two bytes are uh, swapped. So 
you really need to have the documentation or you will have uh, lots of trouble when doing this. So for my initial project, I implemented the CCTalk protocol uh, on a TNC, a small TNC device, and uh, it simply pulls uh, a coin acceptor sometimes, and uh, as soon as there is uh, a new coin inserted, it will uh, send a, a keystrokes to, to MAME, the emulator, to, uh, to actually insert the, the credits in the game. So here you have the board. There's a bus pirate there uh, behind. That's because uh, it was only for debug. You have the tin C right here. The con acceptor there. And if I put some money, the game will see that there are new credits. If I put two three francs, there are two new credits just there. Etc. So that way I had the first part of my first project was nearly done, so I was able to put it in, the, in my main cab. It was working, but I was telling me, can we do maybe more? Because uh, that's a simple project. It's, it only uses uh, the coin acceptor I, I bought, etc. And there are many other machines that use those uh, kind of uh, uh, protocols, etc. But the problem is that it's difficult to track those responses. You cannot see them because uh, the header is always equal to zero and you don't know which answer is to which request. And I didn't find any open source sniffer for CC Talk. So I created two tools which uh, are called CC Sniff and CC Parse that are used to sniff data on a CC Talk bus and the other one is used to uh, actually parse the data you sniffed uh, in a way that you can pretty easily uh, understand and learn exactly what happens on the bus. If you want to have a look, can everyone see correctly? Yeah? All right. Sorry? Ah, uh, <laughs> cannot do many anymore. Uh, uh, maybe if I do this, it's a little bit bigger. Maybe you'll see better. Uh, I cannot, <laughs> sorry. Uh, well, so you have uh, on the upper side uh, the packets, all the packets list that you can select. And when you select a packet, you can see on the bottom, the header, the corresponding function directly, so you don't need to check on the table, etc. You have the row dump of the packet. And if you take some other packets, like the one I, uh, I showed you before, the request manufacturer ID, when you check the response, you have an automatic payload decoding. And it's the same for nearly all of the CC talk packets and responses. Again, if you check the read buffered credit and error codes, so the one used. Hi, everybody. <laughs> you know the drill. <laughs> um, can I have a lucky audience member volunteer? <laughs> you, sir. <laughs> oh, I just meant you get to watch us. <laughs> <laughs> We have been doing this all day. Yes, <laughs> sir. Thank you. All right. Oh, is it your first DEF CON? No, sir. God. Oh. All right. Anyway. Cheers. 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 Yeah, don't worry. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> Say what? I don't know. <laughs> I'm gonna go before I have to figure that out. <laughs> okay, where are, where were you? <laughs> <Whew>. <laughs> All right. So yeah. Okay. Uh, so as I said, uh, this is uh, read buffered credits. So I pulled the con acceptor to actually get me the the data, the status, and. I have all the details, the event counter, which is zero because it was starting. 
and all the results that are zero. But with this tool, you can pretty much get any information about what happens and what is happening on the on the CC talk bus. That's cool, but okay. So now I can read on the bus, but yeah, why not write directly on the on the same bus? Like for example, telling the the main board like, hey, okay, I'm the coin acceptor. I received a, a new coin, and now a new coin, and now another new coin. That's new. That could be pretty pretty great. Oh God, <laughs> sorry. All right, so you see the point. <laughs> the problem is that uh, you only have one wire for the whole bus. So uh, if, as an attacker, you, you uh, will receive the request, the device also receives the same request and responds directly. So if we try to respond just before him or just after him, it won't work. It, uh, we have many chances that we will jam the signal and makes, make things quite worse. Fortunately, in somewhere deep in the uh, in the documentation, we have uh, what is called multi-drop commands, which is normally used by the control to uh, to solve addressing conflicts. Like if you have uh, two or three coin acceptors, you can set them different addresses, and it's simply just a comment that you use header 251 address change, and you give as a parameter the the new address to the device. So you just send that packet and the device will say, okay, fine, now my new address is the one you sent. And what is great is there is absolutely no checks made on the device or on the main board that I tested. So you can just connect to the bus and just send one little packet to tell the device to change its address and then you get its address. If I show this, you have the main board there which is address one. The device at address two. It sends credit read. It sends credit responses, etc. I just get, oh, I just get on the bus. Like, I take the address like 77 and just send a packet address change to the device. It will tell the address 99, for example, and I take the address two, and the main board will continue to ask me instead of the con acceptor my status. And that way I can respond, okay, hey, I, I got a new coin. I got a new coin too. Again, 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 again. That's pretty great. But since it's on one wire, you have to be really careful about the timing because uh, if you write something, uh, if the device, another device was also writing on the same bus, it will collab, uh, collide and normally the bus will stop, the machine will reset, or there will even be, uh, I could test it, uh, an alarm ringing on the, on the machine and you have to run quickly. <laughs> I won't say more. So you really have to uh, check for the silence and in the specs it's indicated that the device needs to be pulled every 200 milliseconds. So as the packet needs about eight milliseconds to be sent, there's normally enough time for us to, to do. So the thing is, to sum it up, to hijack a device on, a, on the device, sorry, on the bus, you have to scan this bus to search for a silence period, prepare the injection, create the address change packet, wait for the silence, just send this packet in your silence window, and then directly take the, the address of the device you want to hijack and start respond instead of it. And when you're finished, that's also pretty cool to just set the address back so the device is at its uh, old address and you can just leave and everything works. And again, you need to do this while the bus is in use. It's quite complicated. So I created a tool called CC Jack which automates the hijacking process. It can emulate a device, so it scans the bus, it reads every packet that passes on the bus, and uh, each packet which is uh, directed to the device you want to hijack, he will record the request and the response. So as soon as he will uh, take over or hijack the device, he will start responding by the last response the actual real device used to send. So normally it will be pretty much transparent so the, the main board won't fire an alarm or something like this. It also uses a burst pirate to sniff and inject. And 
one of the coolest examples I have is to inject coins. <coughs> uh, so, as soon as the coin acceptor is hijacked, uh, just start incrementing the counter. As I said, the counter is whenever there is a, there is a new event. So, just put one coin, if it's uh, accepted, that's okay. I check the device and start incrementing the counter and you will see that there is a new event that is the old one that is uh, a new coin has been inserted, etc., etc. Uh, another thing that I use uh, also on the same machine is that if there is a glitch, like uh, if the, the counter value is lower than the one that is set on the on the main board, there will also be an alarm and again you have to run quickly. So as a demo, sorry? Uh, maybe after, I don't know. <laughs> That's up to you. I'm sorry, I, I wanted to do a live demo but uh, my con acceptor uh, just crashed in the in the speaker room like 20 minutes before so. I only got this loosey video. I hope you will understand it. So, what do we have here is a shell, obviously, and uh, here it's the the MAME emulator that I will use to to actually show you what happens. So, the tool CC Jack needs several arguments. You give it the the interface, so the bus pirate, the source address of the device to hijack, the destination, so the address you want to send the device to and a time uh, to sniff the packet so it will listen, li like I said, it will listen to all the responses, etc., and record uh, the new events. I just inserted uh, two Swiss francs, so I have two credits now. And if I send this, I will change the address of the device at address 2, so the coin acceptor, I will send it to address number 7. It's sent. So now the device, the actual device is on address number 7 and I took the, uh, its place and respond at, uh, at its place to the main board. If I look at uh, the values, I see that I have actually uh, learned an answer to request 229, so the request the, the coin acceptor status and the response is for here, yeah, it's zero uh, 01 is the counter, zero 07 is the coin ID, and zero 01 is that there was actually a, a new coin accepted. So now what I will do is change the address. Let's say add a 221. I will add two, no, two new coins. So I will change the payload. And now I will have two new credits. Great. And what I found also is, if I do that again, that will work. And normally in the specs, uh, if the counter increments too much, like there are, uh, if it increments in 10 to 10, normally it only needs to get the last five results, the ones that are actually in the, in the response. But as I found in several machines that I tested is that you can just put whatever value, it will just check the last response code. So let's put FF as the counter value, so we increment by 200 and what happens? Uh, no, no. It's uh, uh, afterwards. It's the it's another uh, another counter that is in the main board. That's only a counter for the the coin acceptor. That's it. All right. So uh, since it's nearly over, uh, we'll get to it more quickly. So as the acceptor is offline, so we are we have ejected. Uh, so we are able to just send commands to it. So. We can uh, change uh, the validation path, so we can just say the path normally that is uh, allowed for the one dollar coins. Uh, that exists, right? Yeah, okay. So uh, you just tell the, the coin acceptor to change, uh, to, to learn a new, a new coin, and uh, you, you set the, the validation path of the one dollar, and you just put 
several uh, quarters or cents, etc., and it will learn this new coin. And when you actually put this new coin, it will send the ID of the one dollar, and the main board will trade it at as one dollar. So it works. That's great. The other thing that is great is uh, you have a several path for the for the money like when the the coin is not accepted normally it will give it back to you so you can try it several times before uh, dropping the the coin and you can also change that so just invert the two so when the coin is not recognized it will get in the machine and if the coin is accepted it will get it back to you so as soon as you as you win you you just play again that's great there are many possibilities and again there are absolutely Nothing, no authentication, nothing. You just have to be connected on the bus. Uh, regarding uh, protection and uh, security, there are several things. You can provide a PIN code on the, on the device. The only problem is that uh, the PIN code needs to be sent uh, in clear text to actually be, be used. So just sniff the bus, check for header 218, that is uh, provide PIN code uh, to a device and just read the four, the four digits that, uh, that are inside, and that's it. You can help by just pulling the power cord and boot back the, the machine, and <coughs> it will actually send the, the pin code. So, yeah, it's, use, it's you know, of no use. There are also encryption. I didn't actually uh, put a lot, of, uh, a lot of time on this, but there are two uh, encryption methods that are used. It's, uh, one of is uh, proprietary, it's a 24-bit key. The other one is a death encryption. And they use a pre-shared key between the controller and the device. So you can put it. But the problem is that it's a different header, so you still can uh, request the device uh, using the unencrypted headers and while the machine is in use with the encrypted, uh, the encrypted one. So why not? Uh, I just added that uh, yesterday I was uh, working in the, in the scissors and there was an open machine so just to show you exactly where you can see that. Uh, you see here uh, the machine is uh, just open here and the bill acceptor is just right here. I don't know if it's a CC talk one. I didn't test it. I just, I want it to be there and not uh, in jail or something. So, <coughs> so it's just, it's just there, the connector is just there so you just can create or put you in the, uh, on the wire. Normally it's the fourth one, it should be that red one there, but I'm not sure. <laughs> so yeah, normally these machines, if they use the CC talk bus, uh, you can just uh, get into them something there. All right, uh, other things, I will get quickly, sorry. <laughs> uh, other things that uh, might be uh, good points of research is uh, the encryption support. Uh, there are m many things that I think you can do there because 24 bits is a bit weak. Uh, you can also dump the internal memory of devices. You can upload a new firmware on the devices. So you can do pretty much many, many, you can do many things with those and uh, uh, that's just the start. So in conclusions, uh, the specific protocols are quite fun to analyze. It's quite easy. You can find <laughs> really fun things to do with this. Uh, you definitely need to look more in, the, in depth in CC Talk because since it's money related information, you, you have interest in applications, right? And just get a bus pirate, it's a fantastic tool for hardware hacking and pretty much all stuff. All the tools are available on my GitHub account, and I will post uh, several articles after DEF CON. Uh, on my website, balda.ch. And that's it, many thanks. <laughs> <laughs>